uh, in terms of predatory activity, one should think of how and why empires sort of act or react uh, when they're fighting others, especially in such close proximity. But again, all in all, you're not seeing much interesting or good said about the Sasanians to merit even their study. We're having actually a field of Sasanian studies, if one uh, can even call it Sasanian studies. Now, while in the West that was the case, I think Peter Brown had uh, made the first uh, real important points in 1971, uh, which has changed the field here. But until 70s, that seemed to be the general characteristics. And hence, no Sasanians, no Sasanian studies, you know, late antique Near East. Interesting, some Hellenistic aspects are great. That should be studied, but you know, that's about it. That's where we stop. Uh, but there's another uh, region, uh, area that is also of interest, and that is the old Soviet bloc, that indeed was much further interested in studying the Sasanians. But again, the way they studied the Sasanians was quite strange, I would say, well, at least for today's standards. Uh, uh, the reason I'm invoking these uh, Soviet scholars is that uh, I, as a kid growing up in Iran, beside one or two perhaps Western book on ancient history, what we read most was Soviet authors, Soviet historians. Because we had someone by the name of uh, Karim Keshavars, who's under 3B3, uh, a gentleman who actually translated most of the important books on uh, Iranian uh, history into Persian, uh, uh, including uh, Kolesnikov's Iran on the Eve of Arabic Conquest, uh, or Petrushevsky, the probably the most read book in Iran in terms of early history of Islam and conquest, uh, Islam in Iran. Uh, these were translated by Karim Kishabar, who, who happened to be part of the Iranian Communist Party and then to the Communist Party, hence his interest in Soviet matters. Uh, but the, later in his life, he just attempted to translate all of these things. Um, of course, the way these texts are written, and that is given in the Soviet uh, system, what is of interest is this class consciousness, this idea of, of course, uh, the upper class uh, oppressing the lower class, the clergy, of course, abusing their power. Uh, and hence, Islam seems to actually be a good thing. We shouldn't think of Islam, according to these Soviet authors, as a religious movement, but in perhaps it's just symptoms of a sort of broader historical movement, I would say. And that is the reason why the Sasanians fell. The class of society which the priests were oppressing uh, the classics. Now, this uh, is something that if you know about Soviet historiography or the way historians approach is quite common and understandable for the time. It's interesting in Iran that 90% of the intellectuals and those who had read history especially the history of the Sasanians and before Islam, tend to subscribe to this tradition. So if you, when you're in Iran, not today, but in general, when you talk about Sasanians, the only thing that you hear, oh, yeah, they should have fallen. It was a corrupt system that had you know, corrupt priests and a, a class-based society. It had to be destroyed and decimated. It was destined because uh, ideologically is you know, not what people today want to know about. So it's not only in the West that you're getting this very negative uh, view of the Sasanians, but also in Iran itself. Uh, at least one of these core areas of this larger Iran Shah uh, place, the place that you expect to be more interested in this uh, empire or civilization, it tends to be much more critical. And the reason for that is not only because of the translation of the Soviet bloc history, which we all read. I mean, I grew up on not only Petrushevsky and Polisnikov, but some of you may know Dan Damayev, who's done the history of the Medes. Uh, you read Dan Damayev, Pagulevskaya, uh, Instrumentsev, and Granotsky. All of these important Russian orientals was really the books that he had access to, to look at. And all in all, uh, when it came to the Sasanians, there was nothing really good to be said. Uh, Again, in the Islamic world, in the larger, perhaps, Islamic world, uh, or even the places that spoke Persian, that would be Afghanistan and uh, other places, there was an added uh, value that made the Sasanians even more distasteful uh, for the people uh, studying this period or being interested. 
and that is what I call the Islamist view, that's uh, C on page two, where the idea, of course, uh, Islam as a religion um, was central, and it was, uh, it was uh, Zoroastrianism as this evil other that is, you know, or has been abused by the people in power. And that was what we also got a good dose of, and I think it is to a large extent still common. Uh, most important ideologue of such ideas is a man by the name of Jalal al Ahmad, uh, who I have used his famous sayings actually in the beginning of the handout at the top of page one. Incredible injustices were visited on people as a result of the ossified customs of the Sasanians, of course. So that became, and what Al Ahmad read, in fact, was quite popular. This is not something that you know someone writes and dies. This circulated, and I'm assuming again, as I said, in larger areas beside Iran that they read Persian, uh, Al Ahmad made a dent and the view on the Sasanians as how they were. But not only in that book, in another um, influential, I think, essay uh, that he had, uh, in, it should be uh, the service and betrayal of intellectuals. He writes. The Sasanians and the Safavids in this period are the dark periods of our history. Or, he continues, at the end of the Sasanian period, religion had become corrupt and was a noose around the masses. So this added Islamist view, along with the Soviet bloc, made these people completely disliked and not really worthy of being studied, unless you want to make a point why Islam is important and how Islam became victorious. Everything became ideological. It, it really sapped the historical narrative of trying to explain reasonings behind the collapse of the Sasanians, Arab Muslim victory. Everything became because on one side you have the monotheists who believe in one God, who you know um, are for right and brotherhood and equality, and then on the other side you have this corrupt class-based society. Hence, it is destined. That is the logical reasoning uh, uh, that was given. Uh, I think this was also expounded by another important Iranian ideologue, Ali Shariati, uh, in 1970, uh, writing about Masab uh, Masab, religion versus religion. He again expounds the same idea. Mobeds, these are religious Zoroastrian priests. Through religion, we're robbing the wealth of the mass. Uh, this is what Zoroastrianism stands for in the society. Or even later, someone that I remember in high school, I had to write essays on uh, here and there, Mortezo Motahari, an important ideologue and intellectual, who was a clergy, in fact, a Muslim clergy, uh, who wrote a book, Khadamat Mutagabil, with a spelling mistake there, Islam by Iran. Uh, he discusses the situation during those times in Iran in terms of class system was a strange one. Education and learning was only for the nobility and the priest. Well, that may be somewhat true, not exactly. At least the evidence that we have, we see that people were literate and more documents are coming. Uh, again, just to drive the point that these are more ideological based ideas that um, I think became popular not only in Iran, but this is what I call the access to, um, at least Iraq, of what these uh, Sasanians uh, stood for. Hence, no interest, or very little interest, in studying the Sasanians. So that brings us, I think, to the 1980s and what we, or 70s, where we said, is it possible to have the creation of a discipline that deals with the Sasanians on their own? Uh, if we have a Hellenic Near East, then we have a Sasanian Near East for 400 years, uh, from this Oxus to Euphrates region that we're uh, talking about. Uh, I think it's quite possible, and things are moving towards that way. And that brings us again to Roman numeral one, what I was talking about, um, where um, uh, in the 70s there was a change. Uh, and I think things are looking quite well. But if you look at the list of the single books written on the Sasanians, you'll see how bad things are. In fact, I could only point to five books in any language outside of Persian that has been written on the Sasanians. How could this other great power of late antiquity that we just uh, noticed by the writings of James Howard Johnson and Pinepa have only five books dedicated to uh, in terms of its civilization. George Rawlinson in 1876, Arthur Christensen, 
1944, which is probably in its 40th reprint in Persian now, uh, Klaus Schipman, uh, who wrote a much more slim book on political history of Sassanians, and I've just put mine in, not that I'm equal to these people, not at all by a long shot, but, and then two, you know, dinky books that I came out. And these are the only things that are really representing sort of a single volume of Sassanian history. That is just really, I think, strange. Uh, and I would like to get actually your uh, input uh, on that as well. Uh, however, uh, in the 80s and 90s, and I think there are two or a couple of places in the U.S. that have really made a change. And I should say one is Princeton, uh, that has trained a number of students who are directly or indirectly interested in the same things that really uh, made it important um, in academia. Right? Uh, who are the students of um, Peter Brown, thank you. So Peter Brown's students, and I have put uh, some of their names who have worked with them, Kanepa, Joel Walker, who come from the field of late antiquity, who are very interested in fact deal with it, have opened up a new avenue studying these societies. Uh, the other place I think was UCLA, not that I, because I came out of it, but we had the opportunity for a while that uh, uh, Cynthia came out, Leah Gomez came out, uh, Scott McDonough came out, I, uh, I graduated from here. Khoda Lovers of Hani came uh, out of this place, I think Hale and Rani is coming. Because Michael Morney was I think the earliest person that we know here in the in U.S. that offered actually a Sassanian history course. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Professor Graf was here who was uh, teaching courses on late antiquity and of course uh, pushed us to think a bit more holistic than just the Sassanians and Professor Urbanistian, which I took my ancient Armenian history, which of course opened uh, our eyes as well. Uh, I you think these two. Syriac studies as well. Syriac studies. I think Peter Brown's people, especially Joel Walker, mm -hmm. they're very much interested in Syriac, and I think and Peter Jonas Abar, yes. And Jonas Abar, exactly, who uh, actually, I think, Portada and Hala have studied Syriac with him and have made it an important uh, field. So that's been one way in which Sassanian studies have actually grown and there's a change in the view of studying Sasanians. Uh, and the ones who have uh, dealt with early Islamic history, Michael Morney I've mentioned by Padwan and Pushari, I my colleague at Ohio now, who was a student of uh, Dick Bullitt in um, Columbia. Uh, Hugh Kennedy and his students now are becoming exceedingly interested. I'm going to Oxford for a uh, round table on late Sasanian early Islam again. So Kennedy, someone who does early stuff, they're all becoming very interesting, including Fred Donner, my, my say. He went to a Amaya conference in June, and he's become extremely interested in Sasanians because there is a logical, I think, continuation from late Sasanian to the early Islamic period. It's just the way we divided our discipline that, you know, oh, I do, you know, ancient and I do Islam, and so let's just cut this sort of cultural continuity, I think, at some place because a group of people came and conference. Uh, I think that uh, is not always a healthy way of looking at it. Of course, there are people who are Iranists and specifically deal with it in the larger context. And I'll put uh, Dick Fry, who was one of the earliest people here working on it, but Yosef B. Silver and Professor Shaidan, who's right behind me. Uh, these are people who are the specialists on Iranistic, so they can do Achaemen services and, you know, Parthians and the Sasanians. But they, of course, have always been pushing the Sasanians. And so now suddenly you have this wide interest in Sasanians from various fields uh, coming about. And I'm hoping that uh, in the future we do get people who are not only interested in the Sasanians, but when we have a hire, we have someone actually who deals with this, what I call Iran Shah, this cultural region, which is not a nation state, that uh, starts in the third century with something that changes certainly in the third century, and I think continues uh, to the 12th or 13th century and beyond. Uh, for my part, what I do at Irvine, uh, not only with writing this book, uh, but uh, we do also try to uh, study the Sasanians in other ways. Uh, one is uh, this website that you have, Sasanica Online, which is the work of a group of people around the world, and I think graduate students from <coughs> Berkeley, uh, from uh, New York, New School, um, uh, in Chicago, and whatnot for helping graduate students as well as faculty uh, to work on the Sasanians uh, from their point of interest. 